be a poor example if I uh, didn't start on time and, and um, so of course I don't introduce myself but I would like to say that today uh, my talk is about interferometric techniques but that's not completely true. The very last technique I'm going to talk about is not interferometric but in any case uh, I think you'll see that already when I'm talking. And I would like to just show you this picture. It's actually I think uh, a useful picture. I I made this picture a long time ago, back in 2011, in, a, in an article. And um, I tried to say, you know, uh, for all of these different techniques we have for measuring uh, things like droplets in, in uh, flows, uh, how do we uh, classify them? And the interesting thing here is something you've probably never thought about. But I've distinguished between a measurement principle and a measurement technique. And a measurement principle, for instance, is interferometry. That's the principle. But there are many techniques using interferometry to measure. And in this case, uh, we're going to look at uh, the phase Doppler. That's an interferometric technique. And the eyelids and IPI is an interferometric technique. And by the way, also, uh, I don't, why don't I have the laser diffraction is also, and I'll put, I'll talk about, uh, sorry, I should have put Fraunhofer diffraction. I'll talk about that also. These are all interferometric principles. And uh, the last one I'm going to do is, uh, and that's the one that's not interferometric, I told you, uh, is, is direct imaging, and I'm going to do a shadow graph technique which you've never heard of, because it's rather new, it's only about two or three years old, but I think, uh, to be honest, several people here could use it. And uh, so this is my, uh, I start with the interferometric particle image sheet, sometimes called eyelids. And phase Doppler, which some of you have seen yesterday, I think Rohit did a fabulous job of explaining of explaining uh, phase Doppler without uh, uh, a lecture. And then uh, this uh, laser diffraction technique, probably the most widely used of all, even if you maybe have never heard of it. And the last one is the depth through defocus from defocus, and that's the, the non-interferometric. Now. Uh, in setting up these lectures, um, I was going to give you in the fundamentals something about light scattering. Namboor Diri did not do that, so I added two or three slides. This one you saw from him. And basically, you know, uh, people say rather lightly, uh, you know, you illuminate and the particles scatter light. But we have to know exactly how they scatter light now. And that's what I'll do with three or four slides. And so, basically, we usually consider we have a plane wave coming in and we have a spherical particle and it scatters light. And that problem was solved analytically and exactly by me, Gustav Mee, in uh, 1903, and Lorentz added something, so we often say it's the lorentz Mee theory. And uh, that, so, electromagnetic waves impinging onto a spherical body, that was solved. It's analytic and you can, you can program it and you can download from Philip Lavin a program that gives you the scattering from a spherical particle. And so, uh, but what you may not understand, and I think most people don't understand, is the following. If you have a particle and you illuminate from the back and you see the camera here, what do you see? Well, you see the shadow of the particle and probably some diffraction around the edges. And you also see a spot in the middle. Where does the spot come from, if it's a transparent particle? And where does that spot come from? Well. Let's take a look. Uh, now, if you, uh, if you put uh, also illuminate from the side, you still see the particle, but now not only this spot, you see that spot, that spot, that spot, and that spot. Where do they come from? And now if you take away the backlighting, all you see are those spots. I just put the white in there just to remind you where the particle was, but you don't see that. So all you see are those spots. You don't see the, you don't see the shadow. So where do those spots come from? Well. Um, uh, this spot and this spot, one of them comes from reflection and the other comes from first order refraction. First order because it's refracted once into the particle and comes out. That's all you see. You don't see the, 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 uh, the actual particle. And we call those interaction points. Those are the uh, entrance points and these we call glare points. In this case, the glare and the incident are both the same. But uh, those are glare points. So all we see are glare points. Uh, in, in our image. This one comes from a higher order, so something, you know, it, it, it came in and came out somewhere, so this is probably the third order refractive. It goes several times through it. And this is, by the way, also the rainbow. Uh, this is why you, why you see a rainbow. Okay, so, um, uh, so we're going to, so what it means is if you're, if you're illuminating from some side and you have a camera over here, 
there's really, for any one mode, a reflection, first order refraction, there's only one way into your camera. You know, the, the ray here is not going to make it to your camera. And the ray here is also not going to make it to the camera. You only see these two spots. So this is what I've said. The path from incident wave to detector is unique. For, that's not completely true. The rainbow, you have two ways into the camera, but, but uh, let's leave it for that. And, and so uh, we're actually uh, uh, just seeing glare points. And please remember that because I'm going to go back to your high school physics in a few minutes and go back to these two glare points that we're going to see there. And these are then uh, unique and they, both, they all lie in, this, in the plane of the, of the thing here. Okay, so let's look. Now what happens, what would happen if, uh, if we now illuminated exactly the case I just showed you. We illuminated uh, with so a laser beam or a laser light sheet and there's a particle here. Then we'll see uh, this point and we'll see that point. Now, because that's the, the reflective glare point and that's the first order refractive glare point. And if we put that exactly in the focal plane of our, oh sorry, if we put that in exactly in the focal plane of our lens, then we'll see the two points. And in principle, if we knew the refractive index of the particle, and we measured the distance between the two points, we would know the size of the particle. So you could do particle sizing by uh, zooming in and imaging those two glare points. The problem is, is they're so small. I mean, the particles may be 10 microns, so the points are maybe 8 microns apart from one another. And then you have a long-distance microscope, and then you see maybe one particle, but no more. You, you don't have a big field of view. So you have, to do a, you have to now think, how could we do that and see more particles at once? But now what would happen if now you went out of focus, so either, you know, you put your, uh, you, you put your focal plane uh, farther out of focus, then the two points come together, and if they're coherent and polarized, you get interference. So I think now back to your high school physics. This is Young's double slit experiment. It's nothing more than Young's does. You know, you have two light sources. <laughs> And in the far field, you get Fraunhofer diffraction, so there are fringes out there. And clearly, if the points are closer together, the fringes are farther apart. And if the points no, are farther apart, the fringes are closer together. So you remember that, I hope, from high school physics. So clearly, if you want to know the particle <coughs> size now, all you have to do is measure the fringe spacing on your camera. Well, if you have a camera, a, large, a larger camera, and you go out of focus, I mean, they also get bigger. Right? The, the, everything gets bigger because it's out of focus. And so now you can take each of these images and say, okay, hmm, I just uh, get the fringes and I get the particle size. And that is in interferometric particle sizing or eyelids. Uh, I don't know what eyelids stand for. In fact, Harda Lupus, uh, his um, postdoc, uh, his uh, doctor uh, guy, uh, they coined these eyelids, and I have no idea why they did say something about droplet sizing. But you can do this with uh, not just droplets. Okay, so I made a I made a video uh, to uh, explain how that works. So the image shape is given by the aperture size. The reason that the each image was round was not because the particle is round, but because the aperture was round. It was a lens, and uh, the particle image size is given by the degree of out of focus. And the fringe frequency or number of fringes gives you the size. So watch. This is now, just ignore this first camera. Ignore that camera. So this is now a laser light sheet. And now we see there's the two glare points, the reflective glare point and the first order refractive glare point. And now we have two points that we're imaging. And now we start going out of focus with our lens. And those two images then, they, they both get bigger and start to overlap. And when they overlap, we get the we get the fringes. So this is one interferometric method of measuring. And then you can see it's a planar method. And then of course, if uh, we do the following, uh, so now what we're doing, this is our development for dentite dynamics. We we made this one out of focus, as I just showed you, and this one we leave in focus. So we get both this picture and this picture. So these are the particles in focus. And you don't really see the glare points because it's, it's, it's not enough resolution. And that helps us know where each of these particles, because these are overlapping. So we can say, well, you know, we've got two particles here. So this gives us the position of where to look for fringes. And it helps you a little bit in the processing. And if you had a fast uh, camera and a fast laser and a pump pump, and now the camera synchronized, pump pump, then you get uh, two pictures and then you can do PID. 
uh, sorry, the last lecture, and then you get the velocity. So you're getting uh, two dimensions and uh, two velocity components uh, and size. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that technique. The next thing is that, uh, so let's, let's think about it. You're, you're having interference between two modes of the same laser, laser beam, two scattering modes of the same laser beam. That's in IPI, interferometric particle imaging. Uh, interference between two modes of the same laser beam. Now we're going to do interference of the same mode of two beams. That's phase Doppler. Okay, so uh, let's go back. I mean, we saw just now, uh, you know, an instant ray comes in, we have some reflection, we have first order refraction, you get a gain internal, you get second, there's the rainbow, that's what you see in the sky, the rainbow. And then you get third order refraction, there's the second rainbow, on a good day you see two rainbows, that's the uh, third order refraction, fourth order, fifth order. So, I mean, you can do this 10 times and eventually you don't get much coming out because it's, it's getting weaker and weaker. But the Fresnel equations explains you how much comes in each uh, interaction at the interface. And so you can do this and now I've unwrapped it. So you can imagine this is now, this is forward scatter, zero degrees, there's 90 degree scattering and there's 180 degree scattering. So I've unwrapped it, zero to 180 degrees. And then we can say, okay, uh, this is now, um, uh, what I've shown is this is the reflection. So what is, I mean, reflection is, go, is everywhere. <coughs> From a sphere, you can see the whole room. And, and so reflection goes everywhere. The question is, what is the intensity here? What's the intensity here? What's the intensity there? And of course, in forward scatter, exactly 50% of all light is scattered in the forward direction. That's diffraction. That's why you see fog droplets when the sun is over there, and if the sun is behind you, you don't see the fog droplets. 50% of the light comes in forward scatter. And so, so we, can't, we can't separate the fraction and reflection, but together they do that. This is the Brewster angle. There's one angle where nothing comes out. And this is the total. This is the total, the black. So watch, I'm going to now show you what happens, what is the intensity of the first order refraction? And you only get to 73 degrees or 74 degrees for water. You know, the last ray that comes in just makes it to 74 degrees and the next one goes and doesn't refract. And this one goes straight through. That's the Poisson spot you see in the, in the middle, in backlighting. And so this is now a first order refraction. You can see first order refraction is more or less responsible for the entire intensity in this region. Uh, reflection, I mean, this is, take a look, that's a logarithmic scale. I mean, there's like, that's a thousand still here compared with that. So basically, first order, and that's why the phase Doppler systems, <laughs> you have a transmitter and the receiver is over there at about 30 degrees because you're, you're picking up this high intensity at 30 degrees in first order refraction. That's what you saw yesterday with Rowett. You know, you had, the, you had the transmitters and the receiver was about 30 degrees from the transmitter. That, you have to, if you're building pressure chambers for injections or something, you always have to have a window at 30 degrees. Okay, it costs you a little more money to buy, to, to uh, build. Okay, and you can carry on and do all, uh, this is the first 10 orders or something, I forget. Uh, no, maybe not 10, but quite a few. And this is for one polarization, this is for the other polarization. Here's the rainbow that you usually see as the, the second rainbow. And uh, you can see, we only looked at, the, at a few, but uh, those are the ones we generally use, either reflection in this region or refraction in this region. But we use this polarization because it's, it's clear. Okay, so, and this is quite simple to do. Uh, uh, nowadays, our programs that uh, handle that for you. I'm going to show you now a movie, and um, we're going to say that was for water. Well, actually, we have to always talk about the relative refractive index. So the medium, so the, 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 the um, in this case, the droplet compared with the medium. The droplet is water is 1.33 and the air is 1. So the relative refractive index is 1.33. <coughs> if you had a bubble in water, you have 1 compared with 1.33. The relative refractive index would be 0.75. Yeah? So I'm going to show you now this picture with a moving refractive index, relative refractive index. And you'll see that here. See, watch, there's the refractive index. And at 1.33, we have water. There's water. There's the two rainbows. <coughs> and it should repeat itself. And you can look at 0 0.77 would be bubbles in water. 
Because we can use these techniques with bubbles in water if they're spherical, why not? It's all the same. I don't know if it repeats itself. Maybe not. Uh, no, it's repeating. No, it would. No, it, it never did 0 0.75, maybe. No, it didn't go down to 0 0.75. Okay, so you can see this is quite a dynamic thing. And, and uh, if you do eat different fuels, so acetone or uh, ethanol, uh, sometimes you get difficulties in some of these techniques with uh, different refractive indices. Okay, and then uh, this is also um, uh, one slide you saw in the first lecture uh, on the fundamentals of optics. And we didn't talk too much uh, about the scattering intensity, uh, but it depends on, so this is the scattering intensity as a function of particle dot dimensionless particle size. Dimensionless particle size. I've put the particle diameter for this wavelength up there. And uh, this is the intensity, and this is in the, in, when particles are very small, you're in the Rayleigh scattering region, so everything's about uniform in all directions and goes d to the sixth. And in the me region, which also Sri Krishna was just talking about, roughly d squared. And, uh, and then it becomes your geometric optics. But you can see, you see, you could, you could say, well, that's exactly what I need. I'll just measure the intensity and know the particle size now because it's d squared. But this is a great picture to see that that doesn't work. I measure the intensity and then I know the size. Or maybe it was this size. Or maybe this one. Or maybe this one. Or maybe this one. Or maybe this one. We don't know. Forget intensity measurements. <laughs> Just believe me. <laughs> Forget intensity-based measurements. Uh, because it's, it's non-unique. Okay. But uh, this it gives us an idea that, uh, you know, uh, as he said also with the PIV, if you have very small particles, you need more laser lights. Uh, laser power because uh, the scattering intensity goes down. So we usually divide it into Rayleigh, Mi, and geometric optics. Okay, this is now, that was a fast course 101 in, in light scattering from small particles. Obviously, you can write a book about it. I did. You can buy it, and I'll earn one euro. <laughs> I think I earn about 100 euros a year for this book that took us five years to, to uh, write. Okay, so uh, it's, it's not worth writing uh, academic textbooks, I can believe you. I think you can believe me. Okay, so now we go to the uh, phase Doppler technique. Now what we do, it's basically a laser Doppler, so we have two laser beams coming like that. I'm going to describe it without the picture. And we have two laser beams coming like that, and, and so where they cross, you have these interference fringes, you know, uh, and now a particle goes through there, and this particle going through, it'll, it'll go see these interference fringes, you know, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, and mm, you'll get some signal coming out, dark, bright, dark. But actually what happens is uh, you have these, this one beam goes into the particle, and think about it, and now it goes, mm, first order refraction comes out, and the other one comes, uh, first order refraction comes out, and there where they come out together, <coughs> they're overlapping, but they had different paths through the particle, no? because one went here and one went here. So they have different path lengths, and so the phase will be different here. And so what you'll get, you'll get out there hmm, fringes. Those, there'll be fringes out there. And if the particle's bigger, the fringes will be closer. And if the particle's smaller, the hmm, fringes will be farther apart. So we could get, you have two glare points. Now you have two glare points, same scattering order from two beams. Remember, IPI was two glare points, two different scattering orders from the same beam, and now we have the same scattering order from two different beams, but two glare points, and two glare points interfere out there. And you've got these fringes out there. And if you, would, if you had had, in 1982, when we did this, if you had had the cameras we now have, you just put a camera out there and measure the fringes, and you'd get the size of the particle. We didn't have the cameras. So what did we do? Well... As the particle is moving through the volume, these fringes are going like this. So if we put two detectors and measure the frequency and the phase difference, we get the fringe spacing. And that's why it's called phase Doppler, because that's the way we could measure the fringe spacing in space when we didn't have the fast cameras. Okay, so, so we call it the phase Doppler because it's a Doppler, uh, it's a laser Doppler. The, the frequency gives you the speed of the particle through the fringes, and the phase difference gives you the fringe spacing in the end. You have to work it out. But now you can see, if we know the refractive index, we know the wavelength, we know the intersection angle, we know where our detector is, we know how far the detector is above and below, then we know the fringe spacing for a given particle size. We need no calibration. 
Everything is known. The only thing that is a little bit uncertain is the intersection angle. We can't measure that to very, we can measure that maybe to 0.1% or something, but not, not better. So we need no, so that's why we have two detectors at two different elevation angles to see those fringes. And, uh, and I've put here, these are the things you have to know uh, you know, to to uh, work out these, and so then you have to go through the uh, the mathematics, of course, which I'll show you in the next slide. But this gives you an indication. I see that doesn't show up very well on that. Um, it doesn't show up very well at all. So basically, what I'm showing are two beams coming in here. There's a particle, and, and then two glare points close together. These fringes are far apart. This is a larger particle, and the two beams uh, then the two glare points are farther apart and the fringes are closer together. Same thing you can see here, maybe a little better. In any ways, the paths of these two beams are different coming out to the detector. So that's why you get interference. You have phase shifts between them. But that's the reason you have to have coherent light and you have to, it has to be polarized because without polarization, you don't get interference. It's an inner product. So if, you, if they're not polarized <coughs> in the same direction, the inner product is zero. Okay, so... So these are the, this is the mathematics you have to go through. The very first person to do that was Flergel, uh, 1975 in, in Bremen. And then uh, eventually got picked up. And this is for reflection. So if you're using, your, if you put your detector where you only had reflective light, you would get this. And if you put your detector where you only had first order refractive light. And that's why, I'm sorry, I have to go back a few slides now. That's why this picture is so important. This is really, really important. You have to choose an angle where one scattering order dominates completely. Otherwise, you get all mixed up. You have two scattering orders entering into your detector, and, and then there's no uniqueness in the, in the mathematical expression. And that's why typically 30 degrees, or you go into backscatter <laughs> over here and use second order refraction. We have also expression for second order refraction. Or if you want to use reflection, uh, then you can. Uh, then you have to go uh, into a region like this, where reflection is basically dominating completely over everything else at 90 degrees. That was actually the first measurements <coughs> were liquid uh, liquid metal particles in reflection. So the you, liquid metal, there's no refraction. Of course, everything gets reflected. Okay, so let's go back to where I was. Um, so uh, uh, before I look at that signal, let's take just take a look. These, they look complicated, huh? <laughs> but I'm going to try and tell you that they're really simple. Because take a look. Uh, this you know, and this you know, and this you know, very accurately. There's the particle size, linear, with phase difference between the, the two uh, signals on the two detectors. And this you know, 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 that you know, that you know, that you know. That you, know. you know it all. You can put that, you know, uh, and the manufacturer has manufactured, so most of them are constant. And uh, so you, you have a linear relationship between phase difference and size and with no empirical constant, no adjustable constant. And of course, the two detectors give you two signals as the particles in and out of the Gaussian beam, you know, Gaussian beam. And uh, there's a slight phase shift between the two and the phase shift is this uh, phase shift. So you can solve for dp. And take a look. This is now first order refraction. And there's something new in here, m. M is the relative refractive index. And of course, that doesn't appear where you have only reflection because nothing goes through the particle. <laughs> okay, so it depends which, you know, how you've set up. But generally, we work in first order refraction at 30 or 40 degrees. Okay, so this, this is then a little bit the setup. Uh, you know, you would have, um, so two beams, it's a, like a laser Doppler. And you have a measurement volume, and then you have a receiver with uh, two detectors, and then some sort of a processor, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And the, uh, the signal we've already looked at. And how you get the phase difference, I'll do in, a, in the next slide. Uh, and, but I just wanted to remind you again, um, I forgot that I had that slide, that you must show that one, uh, or set it up so that one scattering order is done. <coughs> Okay, I'll skip that. That's just another way of showing where the scattering orders are dominant. Okay, so now the problem, of course, arises, and this is what Rowett attempted to tell some of the groups yesterday very successfully, and that is now, of course, if you've got these two detectors, 
and, and here's the fringes. And now what happens when the particle is getting larger and larger and larger, the fringes are coming closer and closer together, and then you don't know how many fringes are in there. You get a two pi ambiguity. You don't know, uh, and so you have to solve that somehow. And one solution is just put a third detector, and then you have some, uh, you have two phase differences. And the way we usually uh, look at that is the following. So normally, normally if you have just, uh, uh, just two detectors, this would be the diameter of the particle, and this would be the phase shift. So you could say, well, the phase shift goes between 0 and 2 pi, so if I measure a certain phase shift, I know the particle is this big. No problem. As the particle gets bigger and bigger, <laughs> the phase shift, I mean, 361 is 1 degree. <laughs> so you're back here. So then you say, well, I measured a phase shift. What's the particle size? Hmm, not too sure. Is it this one or this one? I don't know. <coughs> what we call 2 pi ambiguity. And so the solution with the third detector, it has a different line. It has this line. And then, of course, if you measure now a phase shift 1, 3 and 1, 2, then you have this, uh, then you have this phase shift and this phase shift. And if both of them give you the same particle size, you say that's probably the particle size. I mean, you allow for some little band around each year to make sure that I mean, there's some uncertainty. Okay, and that's, how, that's why most, almost, well, actually all systems have at least three detectors. And the systems you have here in Madras are from Artium, and they all have three detectors. That's Will Bacello has designed those. He turns out also to be Canadian. That's why I know him so well. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and that's the system now from Dantec Dynamics, I think, I've, yeah, I've got the picture from them. So you buy these things, they cost some money, and uh, anyway, so three detectors. There's another solution to this, and that's what we invented in 1996, and that's what Dantec usually sells. Um, normally, uh, you're interested not only in measuring that velocity component, but also in that velocity component. So normally you have hmm, four beams, so two green and two blue, or some other color. And so the question is, uh, if you have those two beams, and they'll, pre they'll present not fringes like that, sorry, they'll present not fringes like that, but fringes like that, and they'll be different than those ones, uh, maybe you could do a phase Doppler in the planar mode. So now we could put the two detectors not with different elevation angles, but with different scattering angles, and you can do that. And eventually, uh, uh, basically what you're doing then, and that works, that you can also size in the planar mode. And if you combine the two, essentially what you're doing is with the normal one you're measuring on this meridian two glare points, and on the, on the planar mode you're measuring two glare points on this meridian, or on this equator, and um, so you're actually measuring essentially you know, the size of the particle based on this meridian and the size of the particle based on this equator, and if they're the same, then it's spherical. So this is also a spherical check. Will, I could never convince Will that that was a good idea, and I think because he just didn't want to admit that it was a good idea, so he still builds his with three detectors, and Dentec builds them with four detectors, and we call it a dual-mode phase Doppler. Anyways, that's, that's another story. Maybe at the coffee break we can <laughs> talk about uh, personal animosities. Okay, and anyways, it works the same way. You do some phase difference, and there's slightly different equations. Okay, and uh, then you also have validation. The phase difference in the planar must uh, give you the same size as the phase difference in the, in the standard <coughs> system and then you know that you have the right answer. And now what happens if the particle is aspherical? Then you move away from these sort of uh, uh, standard curves, and then you know it's aspherical, and you throw it out and say, okay, I can't size it. You could, there are ways of sizing, but it's, you know, it's, it, there's always a little bit of uncertainty and non-uniqueness. Okay, so I've uh, left out now uh, a lot of other details about phase Doppler systems, but I can assure you, Rowan is extremely well informed. He knows what's going on. And so if you have a question, he's somebody to turn to at any time. And um, so now the next question is, how do you find the phase difference from a sinusoidal signal like that? 
and I don't know how much you do in signal processing, but I think I can explain it in a way that everybody understands. And um, uh, so I'd like to um, uh, uh, start with this. Basically, again, without the, without the equations and whatnot. Like basically, you have two sine waves. <laughs> and you can, you can do the cross-spectral density function. And if you do the cross-spectral, so the, the spectral density of one signal, everybody knows the, the power spectral density. That's what you see on your audio system when it's playing music, you see the power spectral density of the different frequencies. But if you have two signals, you can do the cross-spectral density. And if you do the cross-spectral density and everything is in phase, everything goes into the real part, it's, it's the, co the coherence and the quadrature function. It's an, it's an imaginary number, the, the coherence, the cross-spectral density. And if everything is in phase, all of, it, all of the power goes into the real part. And if it's exactly out of phase, all of the power goes into the imaginary part. So clearly the phase difference is the arc tangents of the real divided by the imaginary part. So uh, this is what we do, is we typically take, we have a, the, the Fourier transform of the X signal, the Fourier transform of the Y signal, and then we do the cross-spectral density function. So it's the magnitude uh, of the cross-spectral density, and and th this would be the, the coherence part, this is the quadrature part, and the magnitude uh, would be that squared plus that squared square root of. And, uh, and so if we do that, uh, then this is the, sorry, that's the Fourier transforms, and the cross-spectral density is then just like power spectral x conjugate times y. And um, then you can go and say, there's the magnitude, and there's the phase. So it's just arc tangents of imaginary divided by I think it's, everybody knows the real imaginary, there's some in between, and the angle is then arc tangents. Or, and so uh, this is, this is push-button stuff. You don't, you don't have to program that anymore. FFTs do it all for you, and, and you just, it's in that lab or something. And these things are hardwired FPMK in, in, uh, in, in these processors. This goes basically online. It's real time. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, but uh, visually, graphically, it looks like this. This would be the, the power spectrum, the cross spectral density magnitude, and of course they're sine waves, so almost all the power is at one frequency. And this is now, this is now the angle. So at this frequency, the two signals are phase difference by this much. And of course, it's all over the map here because there is no phase, it's just noise. But at this frequency, the phase difference is pretty steady, and that's the phase difference we're computing at that frequency. Right? Because at other frequencies, like the noise frequencies here, there's no, there's no uh, coherence between the two. Uh, it's, it's just random. But at that one frequency, the phase difference is quite, quite distinct. And we hear the phase difference we can, was it then 86. No? We, we compute. That's what you're doing mathematically. That's a graphic representation of what you're doing. Now, that's all I'm going to talk about the phase Doppler. And um, for the lucky groups that now go to the phase Doppler, you'll understand what Rogan tells you, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay. And, um, and for those that were there yesterday, maybe a few puzzle pieces are falling into place, I hope. And uh, now, this is now the, the laser diffraction technique is the most widely used technique of all. It's used regularly in industry. It's kind of a, we say in German, idiotensicher. It means even an idiot can, can work it well. <laughs> okay, so it's fail safe. We would say in English, fail safe. Uh, or foolproof, foolproof. So this thing you plug in and it works. But whether the answer is correct, that's another question. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look how the laser diffraction. It's also interferometric, of course, because diffraction is interferometer. And so, uh, basically, this is the airy fringes. This is what, what you saw, you know, the, the peak in the middle and then rolls off. If you, if you illuminate a particle or you, you illuminate a little hole and, and see what, what's on the screen, uh, you know, if you illuminate a, uh, like a, a pinhole and you look at the screen, it's sort of, you know, you have a, an airy an airy pattern, and that's the pattern, first order Bessel function, and you can describe it exactly like that, with some intensity, uh, uh, reference intensity, and x is now, uh, the, again, the me parameter, so x is the dimensionless particle size, the made dimensionless with the wavelength, and, um, and i0 is the, is the, uh, the main intensity peak in the airy, um, in the airy peak. Okay, so, 
But this is Fraunhofer diffraction, so this goes like back to Fraunhofer. This is very old, and maybe not high school physics, but de definitely university physics. So um, uh, let's see, graphically, so physically, it looks like that. You have an aperture. It doesn't matter whether it's an aperture there or just a particle. You get the same thing. And so um, uh, you, you image that, and you can see there's the, the airy uh, peak, and then there's a fringe here, and there's another fringe out here. You can't even see it here. And if you, uh, you add a small particle or a large particle, you get different uh, fringe patterns. It's diffraction. So, I, I mean, clearly, I, everybody's sitting there and say, well, I could build a particle size instrument. Why not? Just put a screen, measure the fringes, and uh, the fringe will give me the particle size. And that's what you do. Uh, but then it becomes a little bit more complicated, <laughs> like all these things. And so you make a laser. Uh, you have a focused laser beam, parallel light. You have some particles here. Uh, and, and, and then you have now, these are now concentric detectors. No? And then you try and get the fringes uh, concentric ring, so you average around the ring. And uh, so a segmented detector in annular rings. And, um, and then you get some pattern. Yeah? And now the problem is, um, and I think it's easy to understand immediately the difficulty, but this was solved many years ago. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, already the 80s, uh, these things were, because you need to still need the laser. No? It has to be coherent and polarized. So um, lasers were started 64, and then until before they started getting into the instruments were more in the 80s. And so I actually lived through that period. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Uh, so uh, uh, the problem now, of course, is if you had two particles, uh, then you, uh, they would both have diffraction uh, patterns. And maybe if they were different sizes, they would also be different. And they would all overlap on those detectors, and you'd get sort of a... But, the, but it's superposition. So it's linearly, you know, you just add them all up. So you have all this added... All these particles are, are, are scattering out diffraction patterns, and they all appear on your coherent... on your, on your concentric uh, detector. And so... Uh, what happens is we already had that equation, and now, of course, that's a single particle. And that, of course, if you had a single particle in there, and you measured that, and you knew the reference intensity, then you could solve for x, and you'd have the particle size. That's easy. But now we have different particles in there, and, and, uh, and, and so they're superimposed. Now the, the diffraction pattern from all particles are superimposed. And then, of course... Uh, you've got, and then, then if a lot of particles go through, uh, then you get some sort of an average. No? By the way, you can't measure the velocity of these particles. All you can, you don't know anything about number density or anything like that. Okay, so, um, and then of course, what would happen is if you averaged over uh, a large number of uh, uh, particles, then you would be sort of, here's the probability density distribution of particle size. And so you're averaging over an x squared because it's the intensity goes with x squared. And, and then you're, you've got this uh, a diffraction pattern. And so you're averaging over all sizes of particles from the zero because there's no negative sizes of particles up to infinity. And, and then now you've got an integral differential equation which is going to be more difficult to sol solve because what you want, you measure that and what you want is that. And that becomes then an inverse problem. And you have to say, okay, hmm, how do I solve an inverse problem? Uh, because I really don't know, I don't know that particle size distribution. So what you, what, when you don't know how to solve a problem, you assume a solution and see what comes out with the assumed solution. So you often say, well, I assume that Px is uh, log normal or something like that. And I put in a log normal, and then I go into an inverse and, and iterate until I get some convergence, and then I find, okay, that's the correct uh, particle distribution. Okay, because like, like a log normal or a Gauss would have two unknowns, mean and variance. Now, and you, you iterate on mean and variance until everything fits, and then you say, okay, that's the mean and variance of my particle size distribution, Gaussian distributed. <laughs> okay, this has all been done 30, 40 years ago. The, the things are extremely well developed. Uh, you can even do uh, bimodal particle distribution, so uh, no uh, presupposed distribution. And uh, so this is like an inverse problem. And I think if you know Tikhonov, there's a lot of mathematics behind inverse problems. 
that allow you to do that. I'm not going to describe it in any more detail because nobody ever has to do this. You just push them. It's all done in software for you. But I, I think you understand the theory behind it and the physical reason why you have this. And what I've done then is just showing you this. Now you see why these things are idiot and sicher. No? Also absolutely uh, uh, full, also, uh, uh, foolproof because uh, they're, they're just complete, they're just one unit here and all you do is you put in your slurry or your powder or your spray and, and all you do is just push the button and you get a particle size distribution. But you don't get, you don't get velocities, so you don't know number densities, you don't know concentrations, you don't know uh, uh, velocity or velocity size correlations, anything like that you don't really know. So it has its limitations, but you can imagine uh, for monitoring, process monitoring, this is really the only thing uh, available right now. And so these things are sold by the millions, well, not the millions, but tens of thousands. They're all over. And of course, not quite as expensive as some of the other techniques we've talked about. I'm, uh, I've got myself time now so that um, we have uh, a few minutes left for the last, I've got some pro and contra for this last technique. And I have to give thanks to some of the people I work with on this. Uh, two, are, two are actually in, in uh, ISC here in India and the other one in Shanghai. And um, this is rather simple to understand. If you uh, have a particle uh, in focus and then you, uh, the particle now uh, goes out of focus, so it, it's not in the focal plane, but it's in front or behind the focal plane, then, um, then it will become, sh it's no longer sh uh, sharp. It gets blurred. So it gets blurred. The magnification doesn't change if you use a telecentric lens. So we're using a telecentric lens. So the magnification stays the same, but the thing gets blurred. Okay, so the question is, if, it's, if you have a blurred picture, could you get the size and the position? And already you see there's ambiguity. You don't know whether it's in front or behind the focal plane. So you might be able to, from the point spread function, you might be able to get the size, but you don't know where it is. Okay, but there's a real simple solution to that, and we're working on even some new solutions now. And uh, so the blur radius is uh, dependent on how far you are away from the focal plane. And so uh, if now the best thing is if you could describe that gray blurring mathematically, then, you know, like Einstein said, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. <laughs> so if we have a good theory about the blurring, then it's very practical to make a solution uh, a measurement technique. And that's simple. You take the particle itself, that's the black, and you convolve it with the blur kernel, which is a Gauss, and then you get you could you could predict for a given. Um, and all you have to know is what is the variance of the blur kernel as a function of z. And this you can either calibrate, or in, in the meantime we have analytic expressions. Okay, so I keep the the thing the story a little bit short. In the, the, the variance of that blur kernel is going to depend on how far you are out of focus, delta z, and so you can do some dimensionless uh, numbers here. And what I want to do is then do the following. The, the size of the, if you, if you take that blurred image and you say the gray level is between 0 and 1, and I'm going to take a gray level of, let's say, 0 0.6, no? then I know the size of the blurred image. That's dt. And dt, the image size, at this gray level, to the true size, that's going, that's somewhere up there in our, in our equation. And the, how far out of the focus I am, the particle position to the true size, is also up there. So basically, now I put an eye on here. We have one camera out of focus, and we have, an, so that's i equal to one, and we have another camera, i equal to two, out of focus, but not the same out of focus, a different out of focus. Two equations, two unknowns, problem solved. So all you do is you take two, two cameras, different out of focus, and you solve the two equations, and you get the position and the size of the particle. And this is what we call <coughs> depth from defocus, and I think, I think it will just simply take over now, because this is so simple. And um, so basically, you can could, you could see it graphically now, here it's in focus on the red beam. Oh, sorry, here it's in focus on the red beam, and as it goes out of focus, uh, the, the, the size at that gray level is getting down, and that's the dt, the size of the image. And here the blue is in focus, and it also has a calibration curve, which we now 
you can do self calibration. We don't have to calibrate uh, physically, and so you get you know you get two images. You get this image size and this image size, and then you know where it is, and you can also compute the size of the particle. Okay, that's that's of course simple to understand. It's absolutely uh, uh, interesting. Those are the two equations and two unknowns, and um, the rest I don't want to. Th this is a typical <coughs> setup, so you know you have a telecentric illumination, telecentric receiving, a beam splitter, two cameras, and they're slightly different out of focus with different uh, different uh, lens lengths. Okay, so you would get uh, camera uh, one, camera two, and these are the sizes that we can then work out for the individual particles, and you can see some of them are out of focus completely. Okay, and you do some. And now, just showing, this is the um, atomization of a droplet through a shockwave at, I think, 1.2 or 3, and um, and so we wanted to measure the, the size of particles uh, here downstream, so it's a primary atomization from, the part of, from this uh, thing, and so uh, this is the sort of thing we would get this is one of the cameras, and uh, that's the normalized image with the size of the particle. But now you can see uh, the camera is fast, so we get the time-dependent size distribution. Hmm? Okay, but now comes, so this is, you know, at different times, <coughs> the entire process between zero and one, the different, so the, the big particles come at the end and the small particles come at the beginning, and I think this was different favor numbers or something, I don't know. And okay, so this is rather simple. Now comes the absolutely interesting thing that no other technique can deliver to you, and that's the following. And this is the, this what makes the thing so interesting. And I have to now, although Sri Krishna unfortunately doesn't know about this, otherwise he would have not said that you cannot measure the particle. And it goes back to your question, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, watch. This is now different sized particles, and you can see. You know, eventually the particle gets so small, the gray level is no longer, we reach the threshold, so we can't see it. Small particles, you can see only this far and this far out of focus. Big particles, you can see this far and this far out of focus. Okay, so, so it means if you're doing particle number density, the, the volume you measure is different for large particles than for small particles. But we know that, and we can, we can measure that exactly. So we basically have this situation. For, small, for, for our small particles, we can only see it this much in and out of, I think focus was 85 point or 86 something. So this much out of focus, see larger particles this much, and this is a real measurement. And that, take a look. I mean, basically you know exactly where the particle is and its size, and you also know the volume over which you're counting the particles, so it gives you exactly volume number density. Not flux number density, but volume number density. There's no other technique to do this. And um, I mean, you have another effect. I just talked about the Z, you know, in and out of focus. Of course, as the particles get bigger and you truncate the, the corners, also the field of view gets smaller, but that doesn't really make much of a difference in all of this. Okay, and so this, this, is, only, this is actually more or less my last uh, point, and that is if you don't correct for that volume size, then you get this distribution of particles. And if you say, well, hmm, you know, I counted small particles over a smaller volume and large particles, so I have the distribution I have to correct, then you correct the distribution and you get the blue line, and the uncorrected is the red, and you see there's a huge difference. And almost every other technique has difficulty making that correction because you don't know the volume, you don't know the laser exact. The laser sheet thickness doesn't help you much. It's the scattering detection it's, you know, which order you're seeing, and it gets a little more complicated. Okay, and this is from Wuchou in Shanghai. If you do it quickly, then you can get now three dimensions, three velocity components. So it's a volume measurement of particles, and particle size. Rather interesting. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. I think uh, we're sort of more or less on time. <laughs> so... Um, I'll take my own questions now. <laughs> so, this, can we yeah. measure uh, solid uh, particle diameter using this uh, laser diffraction? <laughs> the laser diffraction. That, yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you. I, it was on the slide. I didn't read it. Uh, that 
um, with laser diffraction, the diffraction pattern that comes out, it doesn't matter. It, can, it doesn't even have to be spherical. You still get a diffraction pattern. And, uh, and, and if it's small, it's still more or less circular. And so uh, solid particles, powders, no problem at all. Slurries, uh, dispersions, mm -hmm. no problem at all. It can be any shape. Any shape. Yeah, it can be any shape. Now, at, when it starts getting larger, then, of course, you get <coughs> distortions to the diffraction pattern. But when they're very small, it's dominated by diffraction. And, and uh, as I said yesterday, you know, the particle gets smaller and smaller, and, and, <laughs> and the image doesn't change anymore. It's all diffraction. So you don't notice the shape difference when it's small. As it gets larger, then you start getting, of course, uh, shadow effects that uh, distort the diffraction pattern. But these things, uh, it depends a little bit, you know, on the optics and the focal length and things like that. So there's set, um, the manufacturer tells you what size range will it be okay uh, and still be reliable. Okay. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Okay, so one, two. Yeah. yeah, so you talk about the blurry spots. The glare spots. Yeah. <coughs> so suppose we don't want to fit any, um, any curve for that. So, uh, what could be the threshold we, we should take? 0.5? I didn't understand your question. You, you don't want to see the glare points or what? No. So, you talk about the blurry spots. The blurred? Blurry, blurry. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. so you want to measure directly the glare points. Yeah. So In focus. Yeah. So yeah, that works. That works. It's just impractical because uh, to, to resolve those points, which are typically only some microns, you have need a long distance microscope, and then your field of view is so small that you only see maybe one particle at a time. So you said that uh, if, if we know the theory that how the uh, variation of the gray scales is varying, then we can exactly calculate the diameter. Yeah, I think we, you're getting a little uh, mixed up. But let's go, let's go back to uh, one of those slides. And um, I think you're talking about this, no? Is no, this, is, no, is this no. what you're talking about? If we had, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So, so um, if we had this picture, we could get the size by measuring the distance between those points. Is that what you're no, talking no, about? No. It's talking about DFD, glare, blurry image. Blurry the image. DFD method. Ah, blurry. Ah, OK. So. And again, now maybe I can understand. So again, what is the question? So the threshold, suppose I don't want to do any mathematics that you have mentioned. So what could be the th best threshold I can set? 0.5? Uh, uh, that, well, there, uh, yeah, it, you won't get the answer. I mean, um, you, can, you can go um, for two reasons. So let's, let's, go, um, uh, let's go maybe back. Uh, I think we're talking something about uh, maybe something like this. Huh? And you're saying, OK, uh, I was saying 0 0.6, the gray level between 0 and 1, uh, binarize everything. And, 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 and then let's say a, a threshold in the, in the blur of 0 0.6 is what I was showing here. And what you're saying is point uh, <coughs> if you took something else. That's this picture here, which I kind of skipped over. Uh, these. Um, that's this picture here. So 0 0.6 are these here, and 0 0.5 uh, are um, are uh, these here, and 0.4 none. So and it turns out 0.6 is excellent. Um, otherwise, you get slightly different. And and by the way, they turn out to be not uh, too symmetric. Doesn't work out well. 0.6 is really excellent. We've done a lot of work on that. The sensitivity to this choice of gray level, and uh, and it turns out that 0.6 is really the optimum gives you the best answer. But that's a little more complicated to explain, I have to say. Uh, you, you have to do some mathematics. <laughs> but OK, I think that you're, what you're saying is just ad hoc. Let's just take a gray level and, and make an estimate. But you have to understand, where does the gray level come from? It comes from this area, from actually a convolution of like a Gauss with the true image. And so if you understand that, then you understand, hmm, maybe it's not so arbitrary. Yeah. And, and then you have to know how the gray level changes with Z. Yeah. This was done by Blazo and uh, somebody in Rouen many, many years ago, but they didn't capitalize on it. They never really looked at it yet. But um, 
Actually, I'm in the middle of preparing a review article exactly on this topic. So one and two camera imaging for particle sizing. Because there's so much happening right now, it's just absolutely dynamic. Every, every month or two, there's something new coming. Uh, yeah, okay, I think one and then two. So I have a few questions. First would be, like, how do you get velocity out of DFT? The velocity? From DFT. From DFT? Just take yeah, the um, consecutive images or? Yeah, it, it, simple PIV. Okay. And then, and then uh, like, so when you go to uh, laser diffraction, it's very similar to holography or, or like say holographic imaging is like extension of laser diffraction. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when, I mean, so laser beam would be in line with the camera in yeah. all these measurements. Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't that uh, damage these camera sensors and like... With holography, you mean? With hol holography. Yeah. Okay, this is a really good question. And by the way, I, I, uh, in the last article I wrote, uh, I had a whole uh, half a page, why we do this and not holography. <laughs> so it's a good question, which I can answer, of course. Uh, and, and so the question is, uh, if maybe some of you are familiar, inline holography, not digital inline holography would be the right way to say it. So you have a laser beam, it's coherent and polarized, and you have particles, and, and these particles, of course, scattered light, but also some of the beam goes unscattered and unscathed, so you have a reference beam, and the scattered is the object beam, and they both come onto the, onto the camera, and you get a hologram. And you can then, out of that hologram, digitally reconstruct size and position of particles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, I mean, this is clearly also very attractive. And the reason we think this is yeah, more attractive <laughs> is, first of all, the main reason is the digital inline holography takes a tremendous long time to compute afterwards. So if you take one picture, it takes you several hours to get the information out of the picture. We take several milliseconds. And the other thing, of course, is then you definitely need coherence. You definitely need polarization. And, and, and then you have this situation also you have... Well, I, th I don't think the camera is a problem that it's uh, saturated or damaged. You just keep the laser power low enough that it's not. I never heard that that was a problem. Okay. But it might be they, they turn it down. I don't know. I never did the digital. But we had, if you go into the Experiments in Fluids uh, uh, seminar series, which we had last night, and, and go back, uh, Palero talked about the digital inline holography about three months ago. And you can just watch the video. It was a very good talk, by the way. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Sir, uh, can you study about a bubble breaking and a bubble coherence in this method? Yeah, this is, uh, that's all. <laughs> you guys have great questions. <laughs> yeah, I have to think about that a little bit. But um, let's say, this. I think Sri Krishna showed that very nicely. When we say particles, we what we mean is bubbles, particles, or droplets. And um, a lot of those techniques I talked about, uh, they presuppose that things are spherical. And small bubbles are spherical, but of course everybody knows particle bubbles can deform easier than maybe droplets or something. And, and non-sphericity is a problem with most of these, maybe not so much with the laser diffraction, but phase Doppler goes bananas with non-sphericity, and you don't get any, any good uh, answers. And, um, and the DFD technique, and holography, basically you would get sort of like a, a shape uh, out of the hologram, it would be okay. Uh, in the DFT, in principle, you can do non-spherical. You would get a 2D projection of a three-dimensional problem. <laughs> and then you have to get 2D descriptors out of your 2D plane projection and see, do those 2D descriptors somehow give me information about the 3D particle? And we've done that for a lot of things like ice particles and snowflakes and things like that, that uh, with aircraft icing. We do a lot of aircraft icing and uh, helicopter icing. And, and, and we know roughly, you know, with these 2D descriptors, we know what a snowflake looks like, basically. But you have to have that information. And you're talking about bubbles now breaking, and um, then they're non-spherical. And, and then, yeah, or coalescing. And then, and then of course, uh, this... I mean, none of these spherical methods will work as those spherical, presupposed spherical particle methods work. So imaging is the best. I mean, just plain hmm, back, backlit imaging, and then you can see. But you, you're still, I mean, you have a 2D projection of a 3D problem. But what we've done um, in this case is we've then used two cameras, orthogonal to one another, and then two mirrors, 
well, I said two cameras, but two perspectives, two mirrors. The two images come here onto a mm, prism. It goes through the prism into one camera. One half of the camera looks from that side and the other half from that side. So on one camera, we get simultaneously orthogonal uh, images. And this, then you get much in more information about the 3D event on your camera because you have two orthogonal images and with one camera. Because these fast cameras, it doesn't matter how many cameras you have, you always have n minus one. You're always missing one camera. It doesn't matter how much, how many you buy. <laughs> so it's always good if you can do things with one camera. So okay, so I think we have now break time, 10:15 yeah. yeah. or 11:15. We're just about on time. Thanks a lot. I, we should have another break, and in 15 minutes we're back to the with the last lecture. Just find out if the T person has arrived. It should have come by now. Okay. Well, last time I saw them, and now I don't see them. <laughs> <laughs>